baby on the deals. Real quick before we start getting into the course material, uh, the the things that are, that, is, that is on your guys' docket. Obviously, the the midterm is this Wednesday in class. Um, I posted the the URL to the study guide on online in Piazza. Uh, and then at the end of this class, we'll have a review of, of the midterm, go, go over the topics at a high level, right? And then we'll cover everything you need to, like, to, you know, what you need to bring and show up and do, okay? And then project number two, checkpoint two, is due this Friday at midnight. Um, quick show of hands, who here has done checkpoint two? Done the entire thing? We got one, okay. Don't be so meek, he's done, okay. Who here has not started on checkpoint two? I saw a hand. Okay, it's okay. All right, fine. Okay. Again, this is why you made it, made it do on Friday, and I realize you guys have midterms and other classes, so that's why we push it off them. Okay? Uh, so the other thing I want to go over real quickly is some administrative stuff. Um, so this, these are the department basically got back to me, and they want me to curse less in this class, so I'm going to try to do that. I can't always promise it. Um, but we are, there's some other things going on that I think are actually kind of interesting, kind of relevant. So first is that I found that there's a Chinese version of YouTube that's basically copying all our, our, uh, our videos, right? So good for them, okay. Uh, and then the other thing is too, because, you know, not that I post this on YouTube just for just giggles, right? I do it because I want you guys to have access to, to everything. We get a lot of email, or at least I get email, from people complaining about the course. Um, so this is, uh, I don't have my list here, hold up, sorry. <laughs> I don't want to use their names. I mean, okay, sorry. So this is uh, this is uh, J L in Seattle. He basically says um, that we're awful. He doesn't like us, and we need to give you back your money. Um, this is C M in uh, in San Jose. He says I'm a joker. Uh, I have I smell the guy of diarrhea, whatever. Like so, it is true. I did have a medical problem where I had bad hygiene a year before, but I'm on medicine now. So this I I think this is old news. What he we got. Um, but occasionally you get actually useful emails, right? So this is actually somebody, Eric Darling, he's from a major SQL Server uh, DBA consultant company, and he watched the lecture from last class on joins, and he said, he said that I said something that was actually incorrect, and he's absolutely right. So when I was talking about joins, I was saying that, oh, well, building hash tables, like building index on the fly, uh, and as far as I know, no database system actually would build a B plus tree on the fly. Only, they're only gonna build hash tables to do hash joins. And he actually says, that actually, this is incorrect. The SQL Server has a feature called index spooling, where they will build a B plus tree on the fly just for the query that, that you're actually doing. And SQLite does sort of something, some, something similar. Um, but anyway, so this is actually a, a really cool website where you can dump out the SQL Server XML of a query plan, a query, the XML of a query plan from SQL Server, and you upload it to the website, and it gives you a nice visualization of this. All right, so we thank Eric for correcting us. Uh, there's much more comments on YouTube for other things we've gotten correct and incorrect, but I'm not gonna read all of them, okay? So, again, does I take any feedback you guys can provide because I wanna make the course better uh, year after year. So don't, don't send me bad emails, send me good ones, okay? All right, so today's topic is on query optimization. So this is actually uh, one of my favorite lectures. We're only, you know, the, one of my favorite topics in, uh, in databases. And part of the reason why it's one of my favorite topics is because I'm actually really bad at it. And this is the one area I will fully admit that I, of all like, database systems, that I don't fully understand maybe to the extent that I would want to. And for whatever reason, that makes me like it even more. Um, and so to understand what we're going to do in, in, this, in this lecture is we have to go back and understand what SQL actually is. Right? So, so SQL is a, is a query that someone sends to the, the database system and, and that says, here's the answer I want you to compute. Right? And it's done in a declarative way. So there's nothing about what the, is in the SQL that says, you know, run this join algorithm, run, you know, run your, your sorting this way. It just says, give me this answer. And it's up for the database system to figure out the, the best way to actually do it. So we saw this, right, when we talked about joins and sorting. I said there's a bunch of different algorithms you could actually use, right? In case of joins, you could do nested loop, you could do hash joins, you could do sort merge. And they have different algorithmic properties and trade-offs. And under different scenarios, you may actually want to run one algorithm versus another. But when you write a SQL query that join two tables, you don't say, 
join table A, you know, take table A and do a hash join on it with table B, you just say, I want to do a join, right? You're just saying what the answer you want to be. And so it's up for the database system, and in particular, the query optimizer, which we're going to focus on today, to figure out what the best algorithm uh, to use for your particular query based on what it knows about the data. And so we saw that there was a big difference in performance when we talked about joins, right? We said that if you do the most stupidest thing with a nested loop join, then you could take your query to take 1.3 hours. But if you do a hash join, then you're down to less than a second. So as we go along, we'll see, well, I'll, I'll sort of mention that uh, in various, various cases that this is the one thing that really separates the commercial database systems from the open source ones. Right? This is what makes commercial, part of the reason what makes commercial databases so, so expensive. Right? Because it, it's going to be this query optimizer. Because they're going to have an entire floor at these database companies with much, you know, dudes with PhDs trying to figure out how to squeak the best performance you can and get out of uh, a database system through its query optimizer. Right? And there's been studies that show in, that the, actually, the Microsoft query optimizer is actually the best one out there. The, not to say the open source ones are bad, in particular Postgres, it's just in terms of the level of sophistication, the, the kind of things they can support, uh, the commercial ones are much better. So the original idea of a query optimizer goes back, in all, as, as many things do in databases, goes back to IBM System R. So remember I said that in the beginning of the semester, System R was this internal project by IBM Research down in San Jose where they took Ted Codd's paper on the relational model and said, Here, let's actually try to build a system that actually implements this. Uh, and so Ted Codd never actually proposed SQL. Um, he later proposed his own uh, declarative language called Alpha that nobody ever actually implemented. Um, so IBM came up with part of the System R project. They came up with, with the, the earliest version of SQL. So given, again, it's a SQL to declarative language, they then need to be, be able to take that a query and actually generate an execution plan uh, that, that, was, that, was, that was efficient. So at the time, in the 1970s, people were arguing that a, a database management system could never produce a query plan as efficient than what a human could write. Right? So therefore, it was, you know, SQL was a dumb idea, or having a query optimizer was a dumb idea, because it's never going to be as good as what a human can do. Right? You can sort of think of this as the same argument they were having at the time of the 1970s about C, the, the programming language. They argued that no human would ever be able to write algorithms and write applications in C uh, and then have a, a query optimizer, or sorry, a compiler or generate a, a, a execution uh, machine code for your program that would be as efficient as what a human could write in assembly. And of course, nobody writes assembly yet anymore, right? Everyone relies on compilers. So it's the same argument, but just in a different context, right? For, for SQL, People argue that it'd be better off people writing code sale or whatever they wanted to do their joins themselves rather than having a compiler figure things out. So as we go along through today, we'll see that there's been many cases where the, so the high level concepts of what the system R guys came up with back in the 1970s are actually still used today. This idea of a cost-based query optimizer is, is sort of the key one. And the algorithms may be slightly different, and some of the assumptions that IBM made in the 1970s may not be so valid anymore, but again, the, the core concept is exactly the same. And the, the woman that came up with this at IBM, Pat Selinger, right, said that in System R, they got like seven people with PhDs in, in one room, and, said, and they said, go build a database system, and every person sort of carved off their own piece. So this one woman, Pat Selinger, carved off the query optimizer part. Um, she was at IBM for a long time. She was at Salesforce and just retired. And I had a former student in this class was working with Pat Selinger, took all my classes, knew about the Selinger query optimizer, and they didn't put one didn't put one to one together that the woman she was working with was the same woman we would study uh, in in this class. Um, so she's still around today, and she has a lot of, done a lot of great work in this area. So for query optimization, we're we're basically going to have two approaches. The first is going to be using uh, heuristics or rules written by us as humans to do some massaging of the query plan to apply some, some obvious optimi or fix some obvious inefficiencies and apply some, some simple optimizations. Right? So the idea would be you have your, your query shows up and you do some minor rewriting of the, the syntax tree. You never operate directly on the SQL. And the idea is that we, there are certain things we know we're always going to want to do to make the query run faster. So we just have rules to go ahead and just do them before we go into the second phase, where we actually now we do a cost-based search. So the second phase is where we're going to say, all right, 
We now have to need to figure out other things about our recurry plan. And I don't have rules that I can apply to say, here's exactly what you're always going to want to do. Because the, the choices you'll make will depend on what your data looks like. And I'll explain what that means in a second. And so we do a search to find what it would be, what is an optimal query plan for, for our query, right? The idea here is that we're going to have this cost model to say, given two potential query plans for a single SQL statement, which one is actually better in terms of, of performance? So just to understand the, so the pipeline of this uh, in a real system, it, it, at a high level, it would look like this. So your application submits a SQL query. And the first step is that it always goes through a SQL parser. Right? And the SQL parser is going to then convert it into an abstract syntax tree. Right? That breaks up the tokens and you know, the select statements, the where clauses, and, get, and gives you this tree. But inside this tree now, all we have are just the strings or the names of the things that were in the SQL statement. Like select star from table foo. Right? In our syntax tree at this point, we just have the, you know, the string foo. We don't know anything about it. We don't know that it, it, it corresponds to a particular table. So in the binder phase, we go do lookups in our internal system catalog about the database. Right? It's the metadata about the data. What tables do I have? What columns do I have? What indexes do I have? Things like that. And it's going to map the, the, the names or the strings that are in our abstract syntax tree to internal identifiers. Right? Just think of like it's a you know internal ID number for a particular table. And then we feed now this annotated abstract syntax tree to this uh, query rewriter, the thing I showed in the first step in the previous slide, where we can apply some rules that we that we know we're always going to want to apply to our query plan to 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 make it go faster, to make the query run faster. And I'll show examples of what that is uh, as we go along. So not every single database system has this, right? You can still just have a query op optimizer without this, this initial step. Uh, but this is actually very common in most systems. And then in the last step, when we take the output of the, the rewriter and feed this into our cost-based query optimizer. And again, think of this as doing like an optimization search, looking at different query plans, getting information about the, what the tables look like from the catalog, and then using some kind of internal cost model to say, you know, here's, the, here's the potential runtime cost of, of executing this query plan. The idea is you want, you want to be able to examine as many query plans as possible within either a, you know, some kind of budget, like in terms of time or the number, the number of plans you'll investigate. And then whatever which one is the best one you've ever seen, that's the one you'll spit out as the final query plan for this query. So as we see as we go along, the, the the optimizer is actually not always going to pick the, the globally optimal plan, right? Because that would actually be really expensive. So it's going to try to use uh, uh, methods to prune down the search space so that it can generate a good enough plan uh, within a reasonable amount of time. So I said this in the beginning, and I'll say it again. This is actually really hard to do. So the joke in, in databases is that if you try to do query optimization and you fail, the fallback plan is you go work on rocket science, right? Because query optimization is harder than building rockets. Um, this is, again, this is the hardest part about uh, building any database management system. Uh, this is part of the reason why a lot of the NoSQL guys didn't end up using SQL in the first place, because if you have SQL, then you need some kind of query optimizer. And this is hard to do. It's hard to get right. There's all these different corner cases, right? As, as SQL expands, the, for, you, know, you have nested queries and other things. This is really hard to get right. Um, the one thing I will say also, too, is that if you're good at this, if you really like query optimization, you will have no problem getting a job. So I have friends in various database companies, and they email me asking for, you know, what, you know, what students are looking to graduate, looking for jobs. And the one thing I always get is like, yeah, we want database students, but we really want anybody that knows query optimization. So if you're good at this, you can have no problem getting paid a lot of money. Because um, when you think about it, you know, what like 22 year old kid coming out of grad school or undergraduate program has experience in query optimi optimizers, right? It's like crusty old guys from the 1990s and they don't really want to, you know, move maybe to a, like a startup and things like that. So this is the one thing that, that database companies are really, really interested in. So as we go along, I imagine and talk about various problems that we have to solve in our query optimizer. A lot of you are going to be saying in the back of your mind, oh, can't machine learning solve this? You know, can't, can I use AI to make this all go away, make it much easier? Yes, but no. Uh, there has been some early research in the last one or two years at looking at using machine learning uh, to, to sort of 
improve the accuracy or improve the, the quality of the query plans that the optimizer generates. Uh, but as far as I know, no, you know, this is still early work and no major database system actually supports this. Um, Postgres has a genetic algorithm-based query optimizer that if you try to do joins with more than 13 queries, then it falls back to that, to the genetic algorithm. But what we'll describe today is basically how most, most systems actually do this. And I'll say also too, for the applying machine learning to query optimizer is actually something we're interested at here at CMU. Um, we do have students looking, looking into this now, but it's still very early. I love query optimization so much. Again, I'm really bad at it, and it just makes me want to do it even more so I get better at it. So in the advanced class, you know, previous year, to already spend two weeks on query optimizers and cost models, but if you take the advanced class this spring, I'm probably going to add another week to go over you know, more complex scenarios. Right? We build our own query optimizer from scratch here at CMU, and we just, you know, I'm very interested in, in making it better. Okay, so for today's class, we're going to talk about... Uh, we're going to have sort of four parts talking about different query optimization steps we have to do. So we'll talk about how to do relational algebra equivalencies to do the rewriting that we talked about before. Then we'll do plan cost estimation. How do you actually say for a potential query plan, how many tuples, how much disk am I going to have to read to make it, make it ex execute it? Then we'll talk about how to do enumeration or searching for different query plans and sort of build up a query plan holistically and look at the cost at each step. And then we'll talk about how to do the two to two ways you can do optimization with nested queries. And we'll finish up talking about, again, the, the, the remaining time going over the, the, the midterm at a high level. OK? OK, awesome. All right, so we didn't really mention this in the beginning of, of the semester when we talked about relational algebra. Um, but the, the high level idea is that what we're going to try to do this in this rewriting step is a query is going to show up will generate the relational algebra from, from, from the, the abstract syntax tree. And then because of rules we know about the uh, relational algebra for, to determine, you know, to permute the expression and still have them be equivalent with, the, with each other, we can apply certain rules to generate a more optimal query plan that way. Right? And this has nothing to do with what my data looks like. These are just general rules that we can apply for every single query because it's always going to be, the, 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 almost always going to be the right thing to do. And so the idea here is that this can be done efficiently. We just have some, uh, some sort of a rule engine that can check patterns in our, in our syntax tree to see whether we have matches. And if we have matches, then we can easily apply, apply those rules and modify the, 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 the tree. So to give you an example of what I mean by this, say we have a simple join on the student table and the enroll table. Right? And the, so we have our join predicate on the student ID in the student table and the enroll table. And then we have an additional predicate on the, on the, on the enrolled grade. And so the, if you just take the, the SQL and almost generate exactly the, the, the relational algebra for this, you would end up with a query plan that looks like this. Right? But what's one obvious thing we can do to optimize this query? Yes? Exactly. Check the predicate. You said check the predicate before we join. So we have our filter on grade A here. But we're doing that after we do the join. So again, always try to think in terms of, of extreme numbers to see you know, how something would actually affect performance. So say we have a billion records in the enroll table, and only two people got an A in the, in the entire university. Right? So that means that when we feed this data into this join operator, we would do a join on 1 billion tuples from the enroll table. Then we have 1 billion tuples come as the output, which is fed into now the filter operator. But then we're going to go now check where you know, grade equals A. But that's only going to match two tuples. So we did a join on a billion tuples where all but two of them is just wasted work because it's not going to get produced as the output to, uh, to the user. So a simple optimization we can apply here is called projection push, or sorry, predicate push down, where we just move down the, the, the filter operator to be below the join. Right? This is sort of like a no-brainer. You're always going to want to do this. So when you look at now the relational algebra for, the, for these two different query plans, we, again, we, we know that they're equivalent. Right? So in this case here, we do the join first, then do the filter. In this case here, we do the filter first, then do the join. Right? There's rules to relation algebra that, that would tell us that these two query plans are equivalent. So the query optimizer can do rewriting of, of this query plan and apply this change without worrying about uh, still you know, guaranteeing that it's going to produce the correct result. 
right? All these optimizations don't work if you produce query plans that are, you know, going to give you the wrong result. That doesn't help us. So there's some sort of standard rules you can do for selections, right? You obviously perform the filters as early as possible. Uh, you can reorder the predicates so that you apply the more selective ones first, right? So say I had something like where e, you know grade equals A and uh, you know age of, above 30. If there was fewer students that had the age above 30 than students that had uh, with an A, then I want to apply that that age filter first. So even though the grade may, may appear first in the SQL statement, I'm free to reorder the expression any way that I want. And maybe apply that that the most selective predicate first, so I throw away as much work, you know much useless data as possible before I go into the, the next stages. Um, and then you could also do you know break up complex predicates and do push down. So you don't always have to have uh, the the you know if they have a where clause and a bunch of conjunctions with a bunch of predicates, you don't have to take all those predicates and push them down in the query plan, right? You may want to select some of them, right? And this may be because some predicates are more expensive to compute than others, right? Say one predicate might be computing a hash or some value. So maybe you don't want to do that down below before, you, before join. Maybe you want to do it after a join. So you're only, you know, wasting the computational resources for things you know are going to match, or at least, at least get through the join. There's other optimizations you can do as well, again, relying on the transitive properties of, of, of Boolean logic. So here we have an, a, a complex predicate like x equals y and y equals 3, right? But we would know that in this case here, if y equals 3, then x always has to equal 3. So we can rewrite this expression to be like this. So now maybe we, we could break up the, the predicate and do the filters on the x table or maybe filter on the, on the y tuples, do them separately. Yes. Is this always true, like you need to break a complex predicate? Because uh, let's say if you don't have an index on R, and you're, you, you know you will have to do a string just then, would you like to do it to just uh, apply all the predicates and what? And so, just do one sequential scan? So his question is uh, if you're doing sequential scan, does it make, is, does it make sense to always uh, move all the predicates down as close to the scan as possible and never break it up? Yeah. Right. So in the in and definitely the open source guys, I think they always push things down. Right. There could be an example where uh, it could be an example where a predicate was be expensive to execute. Like if you say, like predicates can be anything. Right. You can actually you can write a user defined function that makes an invocation to an outside system to compute whatever you want. Right. And say that call costs you money. Right. I'm not saying any system would actually do this. But like you could ha you could recognize that all right this is be expensive to do, so I don't want to maybe do it before my join. I'm gonna do it after my join because it might be a join filter that's gonna filter out even more, right? So you may have a billion tuples going to the join, but then join only, may only produce two things, right? But then rather than having for a billion tuples invoke that offensive predicate, you do it after the join. Okay, so that the DDMS actually is aware of the cost of the predicate. For that for that particular example, you have to be yes. Um, but my UDF example is my UDF one is a bad example because UDFs are treated as black boxes. The, the data system doesn't know anything about that, All right? But that would be again. I think maybe the difference I'm trying to make here is that it's the when I say cost, I think in terms of how it's related to the actual database itself. The computational cost would be is sort of independent in some ways to what how many tuples you have. Like the computational cost of invoking one predicate. It's the number of times you would execute that predicate uh, for the total number of tuples. That's, that's something we'll do on the cost model separately. All right, for projections, uh, <laughs> this is mostly going to be true for row stores and for uh, distributed databases. Uh, but the, the idea is that you want to maybe you want to push projections down as early as possible, so that you reduce the size of, of the of the tuples that you're copying from one operator to the next. Right. Remember we talked about the materialization model, the iterator model, and the vectorization model. Right. You're copying data that, that the operator generates from one operator to the next, pushing it up the tree. And so if your tuples are really wide and you're, you're copying the entire thing all the way up, then you're, you're wasting a lot of space for, for columns you know you're never actually going to need later on. Right. So you go back to our example here. Again, at the top of the query plan, 
we're doing a projection on the student name and the in the course ID. So say that the student enroll tables were really wide, meaning they had a lot of columns, a lot of attributes. So it might actually be better for us to maybe move down the, the projection before the join. So we're only passing in the student ID and the name, and this one only passes up the student ID and the course ID, because that's the only thing you need to do for, for the join here. And the idea is that from one operator to the next, we're copying less data. Again, in distributed databases, this matters a lot, because if you have to then send data from one node to the next, then you're going over the network, and that becomes very expensive to do. Again, in a column store, we said this wasn't going to be an issue, because the column store can be smart and recognize that, oh, I, I only need to read data from this one column, so I'm not going to stitch the entire tuple back together, then pass it up from one operator to the next. It just passes the bare minimum data you need. But if you're in a row store, then as you're scanning this, you're basically getting everything. All right, so let's look at some other examples of uh, how to uh, do optimization without, um, without a cost model. So this actually comes from a really great blog article that came out last year from uh, a, a, a DBA, where he basically came out with a bunch of different types of optimizations you can apply for queries, that, again, without having to do a cost model. And he looked at how the different database systems actually would support them, and whether they can recognize the inefficiencies in, the, in, the, in what, what's in the SQL query, and try to rewrite them to be more efficient or better. All right, so the first class, class optimization we can apply or is recognizing that when we have uh, impossible or unnecessary predicates, right? So select star from table where one equals zero, right? Obviously, one can never equal zero. So it doesn't make sense for us to actually scan through every single tuple and apply this predicate because it's always going to be false and no tuple is ever going to match. Right? So some systems can recognize, in this case here, that this you know, will never evaluate the true. So it just skips the scan entirely. It'll give you back a result set, right? because if I execute a query, I always want, back, I always want a result set. Right? This is not an error. Right? This, is, there's no reason, this is still valid SQL. But it can just be smart and say, well, I'm actually, I don't need to run anything. Here's your empty result. Another example would be like this. Right? Select star from A, where 1 equals 1. Obviously, in our where clause, one will always equal one. So the optimization we can apply here is just throw away this predicate entirely, rewrite the expression to not include this, and then now we're just going to basically take the this, do you know a complete symmetrical scan on the table and just dump everything in our in our output. Right? And the thing we're trying to avoid is again not having to check whether one equals one for every single tuple in our table because that, that's that's useless. So it can just rewrite this like this, and these are equivalent. Another optimization we could apply is join elimination. So say we have a query with a self-join, right? From A as A1, join on A as A2, where A.ID, A1.ID equals A2.ID. And up above, I'm showing the, uh, the schema, and ID is the primary key. So this is a unique column. So there'll be a one-to-one -one match between the ID in, uh, in A1 with A2, because they're the exact same table. So the, uh, the data systems can recognize that this join is actually useless, right, and just remove this entirely and rewrite it like this, right? This is still equivalent. Again, I don't need a cost model to figure this out. I can just look at my catalog, understand that the column I'm trying to join on for this table is the primary key or unique column. So therefore, I just throw away, throw away the join, throw away the where clause, all right? All right another one is to remove uh, uh, useless projections. So here we're doing select star from A on as A1, and then we're going to have a, in our where clause, we have an exists function that says with the inside of this, we're now we're doing a join between the outer A, a and the inner A. So A1 is the outer, A2 is the inner. Right? Why is this useless? What does exist, exists do? Yes. Exactly. It checks whether at least one row return is returned, and it then evaluates to true. So this is basically saying, for, for my tuple, do I exist in, the, in, my, in my own table? The answer is always true, so this is, so this is useless, and we can, throw, we can rewrite this be like that. All right? The last one is to do uh, merging the predicates. So in this case here, we're doing a select star from A, and then we have uh, in, our, in our where clause, 
we have two between, between predicates. So between, there's a shorthand way to say like greater than and less than, or le less than and greater than, right? So this is saying where val is, is between one and 100, or val is between 50 and 150, right? What can we rewrite this to? It's a disjunction. One to 150, right? Because these two ranges are overlapping. So again, instead of looking at every single predicate, every single tuple and, and evaluating this predicate, I can just rewrite it to be like this, and that, now that's much more, much more efficient to, to execute, right? Again, so there's a bunch of these different rules that the, the, the various data systems support and can have. Some are better than others, um, and we can try this out real quickly to see what kind of things they support. So let's do this. So this is going to be a, um, a sample database from the, the blog article, and I, I highly recommend you guys check it out. The, the link is in the, the slides. Um, and so he had a, uh, he provides a sample table, or sam sorry, sample database f that's based on, um, that doesn't work, that's based on a, uh, like a video store. So there's films and people like rentals, right? So it's sort of a, a sample schema. And what's awesome about it is they provide it in, uh, for MySQL, Postgres, SQL Server, Oracle, SQLite, they provide it for a bunch of different database systems. So we can try it for uh, all these systems at the, in the same, same scheme and the same query. All right, so this one we have Postgres, we have MySQL, I got the Linux version of SQL Server 2017 running on, on, on my machine, and then we also have SQLite. So let's start with the first one uh, in, in Postgres, right? Select star from actor where one equals zero. And here I'm doing explain analyze because I actually want to execute the query and see what Postgres actually does. Right? And so again, this is this is an impossible where clause. So we know that it, uh, it shouldn't actually look at any data. In this case here, as far as I can tell, it, it actually it looks like it didn't actually run at all. Right? Because it says rows equals zero. So it's a one-time filter that's always valued to false. So it knows that there's, this thing will never value it to true, so it just doesn't execute anything and this gives you back an empty result. Let's try this in, uh, in MySQL. So MySQL doesn't have explain analyze like Postgres does, uh, and their explain is not as good as, as Postgres. Um, Postgres actually gives you the, the query plan tree, which is actually really nice. So MySQL gives you, this is 5.7, gives you some metadata, and you see here it says impossible where clause. So it didn't actually run anything. It just recognized that uh, this thing will never evaluate to true. So it, it, it knows it doesn't actually need to scan anything on, on the table. We'll try this in, um, in SQLite. I don't think SQLite gives you a good explanation. Yeah, it doesn't really tell you anything. All right, it just says idea scan on table. If I remove the query plan clause from it, um, it gives you a bunch of this. I won't, I won't explain this now, but basically the way SQLite actually executes queries is that they convert the query plan into these opcodes. Think of like the bytecode in the JVM, and then they have an interpreter for it, right? which is kind of interesting. So th that's, what all, all, that's what all these opcodes are, and then this is sort of roughly showing you what, what they're actually doing. So as far as I can tell, it doesn't, uh, doesn't, look, it doesn't look like they're able to recognize that it's, it's an impossible query. All right, the last one was uh, uh, SQL Server. So SQL Server, as far as I know, does not have, uh, does not have explain. You have to do this like show, show plan thing, right? And it tells you that it's turned on. And then we can now run a query. And it doesn't actually run the query. It just tells you that I did it. Um, and here, again, there's no, there's, no, there's no metadata to say whether it recognized it was impossible, right? It says constant scan. And I, I suppose that they would evaluate the false and knows it doesn't actually do the scan at all. All right, let's try the, uh, the range query one. So we go back to Postgres. Um, so Postgres is, is not able to recognize that these predicates be merged. Again, they rewrote the between clause to be greater than equal to and less than equal to, but it still looks like they're still going to perform the the you know, the, the scan for both of those predicates, right, the, both of those ranges. We go to, uh, to MySQL. All right, 
No matching row in const table. Ah, sorry, sorry. I, I, I mean, let me go back to this. Let me explain it. So actually, I'm not doing the same range scan I had before. I'm actually doing an impossible range right between one and two, and uh, between 199 and, and 200. Right. So these are disjoint sets. We're doing a conjunction on them. Disjoint ranges. So it should never get, never actually match. So my SQL actually does the right thing and is able to recognize that this is uh, actually it says here no matching row in const table. So maybe it actually did apply it. But in case of um, in Postgres. Again, it didn't recognize that these are impossible ranges and still did the scan on it. Let's try this in SQLite. Again, as far as I can tell, it's it's still doing the it's still doing the range scan on the, on the query. It doesn't recognize that these things are disjoint. And the last one would be. Um, where are we? There we go. We'll try this in um, in in SQL Server. Again, it doesn't tell you anything. It tells you the constant. There's a way to turn on the more verbose like XML query uh, query plan of of the of, of SQL Server, but you need you need a viewer for that, which I don't have. Right? It's just we just have the, the terminal. All right. So the last one I want to do is the projection pruning. Um, so this is back. This is back to Postgres. So here we're going to do a select statement, and all we have is just exists where select is one divided by zero, right? So ex again, exists returns true whether there's at least one thing that will match inside of inside of the whatever we have inside of it, right? So I could do something like this: select one, right? Something will match because there's a tuple with with one attribute. The value is one. And then the outer select will say, all right, is there anything inside that inner select? If yes, then return true. Right? So that's what we expect, like this. So the question is whether Postgres can recognize that no matter what value I put in for the inside this inner part here, right? No matter what's in there, there's, it's always going to be a tuple. So therefore, it's always going to evaluate to true. So therefore, it doesn't need to even execute whatever that projection is in there. So I can try to compute, you know, the, the, the millionth digit of pi, it's still going to evaluate to true. So you want to see whether Postgres can recognize this and not actually execute anything. And the way we can test this is by doing an invalid division, right? One divided by zero. So if it actually ex executes that, that predicate, then it'll, it'll throw an error. If it doesn't, then it'll just say true. So raise your hand if you think it'll execute it. One, two, eh, five percent. Who thinks it's smart enough to know not to do it? <clears throat> no one's willing to take that bet. Few people. Okay, right. it can do it, All right? So we can try this in uh, in SQLite. All right, comes back as true. Let's try this in uh, MySQL. Comes back as true. Question though is, I'm actually not sure if MySQL actually executes this, um, right? So again, if I do this, if I do like that, it'll th it gives you back null, but then it gives you a warning, and then for 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 MySQL, you have to do this command, and then it says division by zero, right? If I try this in in Postgres, it should actually just throw an error, right? Division by zero. So I'm not sure whether uh, MySQL is actually executing this or not. Um, but we can try another case where we can try to give it an in, invalid uh, power, and that, that comes out to be true too. So that, I, think, I think it's doing the right thing. Right? In that case, it throws an error if you try to do that, whereas like, the divide by zero doesn't throw an error. Again, so the, the main takeaway from these is these are all rules that are going to that the system can, that can use before you even get to the cost-based search. Because it knows that these are some optimizations I can apply because they're always, almost always going to be the right thing to do. OK? OK. So for, for single table queries, you know, this query optimization is pretty straightforward. 
Um, for joins is, is with the, the tricky one. This, this is the one where we're going to have the most problems. All right, and the, the part of the reason that we're going to have problems is that we can apply both commutativity and associativity rules for, for our joins and reorder them in any, any way that we want, and we're still always going to produce the correct result. All right, so if I want to join R and S, that's equivalent to joining S with R. Right, still going to always produce the correct result. Or if I want to join R, S, and T, I could join R and S first and then join that output with, with T, or I could join S and T first and join that with R. All these are equivalent, all these are valid, and so we had, we, but they're going to have different performance characteristics. Right? We saw this when we talked about join algorithms. You always want to put the smaller table as the, the outer table. So now how are you going to pick which one to, you know, which one, which to join first and which one should be the inner versus the outer? So what makes it so hard is that the total number of different combinations we could have is 4 to the n. Right? You know it's a big number when it has a special name. Right? So it's called a Catalan number. Right? And so the, because there's so many different choices we could have for our join orders, and that we're not going to be able to, to, to compare every single one, we need a way to, to prune the search space. Right? Because doing an exhaustive search is just going to be way too slow. So we're going to hold off on this for now. We'll talk about how you're going to estimate what, whether one join is better than another. And then we'll see how we can then figure out what the join ordering should be. So the, in the, the, the cost-based search, search optimization, the idea is that for a particular query plan, so the idea is going to take a query, uh, you generate the syntax tree, and then now say there's joins, you want to figure out in what order you should actually join your tables. And so you're going to try a bunch of different combinations of those different join orderings, and you need a way to figure out which one is better than another. So you're going to use the cost model to be able to do this estimation. All right? And so it's, the cost model is going to generate a number that's internal to the database system, meaning it's not really going to be a, uh, uh, you know, tied to wall clock time. It's not going to say, you know, this query is going to take 10 milliseconds, this query is going to take, take 100 milliseconds. Right? It's this internal metric that it uses just to compare whether one query plan is better than another. But it's going to be derived from a bunch of different information that it can collect about your data and about your hardware. Right? So you can try to th think about, like, all right, well, this join algorithm is going to take this many CPU cycles, and uh, I'm going to have this many cache misses. So you know, I'll wait that be more than the other one. I know how many blocks maybe I have to read from disk, or how much data at the center of the network, how much memory I'm going to use. So this cost model is being a combination of all of these things. And again, the commercial guys are way more sophisticated than the open source guys. Um, and then it's going to use that again to determine whether one is better than another. So the way you need to figure out how much resources the query is going to use is based on the statistics and information you're going to derive about the underlying database. Right? You want to know in how many tuples do I have for the table from table A and I'll join it with table B. How wide are those, those, those tuples? Uh, how fast is the disk that they're stored on? All this information you need to maintain then in order to figure out uh, what the how much it's going to cost to execute it. So every single database system that has a query optimizer has to have, a, you know, it's going to have a cost-based query optimizer, has to maintain these internal statistics that it's going to collect about the data. So if your data is read-only, then this is not a big deal, because you just sort of scan over it once and maybe try to collect, collect as much data as you can. I shouldn't say it's not a big deal, but it's, it's, uh, it's less challenging than if you're in a dynamic environment where your data is always getting updated. So the way database systems manage this is that they typically have a background sort of stats collector, I think that's what Postgres calls it, uh, that's going to scan through your data every so often or wherever, wherever, whenever you invoke it and derive some information about what the distribution and, and the values look like and then maintain that in the internal system catalog that it can then be used by the optimizer's cost model to, to make estimations. So again, the different data systems have different rules about when you actually collect this data. Right? It can be like if my... If I update 10% of the tuples in my table, then I'll fire off the, the, the background stats collector. Uh, if I delete all of it and load it back in, I'll, I'll run, it, run, it, run it again. Um, you can also manually invoke these things, right? The, the Postgres and SQLite and a lot of other systems have the analyze keyword. Um, and that just tells you to again scan through a table and, and collect this information. Uh, SQL Server is updates statistics and then DB2 is, is run stats. So there's nothing in the SQL standard to say do this. Most of the times you see analyze. Right, but Oracle MySQL had to be different when analyzed table. 
So what, are these statistics, what do these statistics look like? Well, at the highest level, the most easiest thing is obviously the, the number of tuples I have in my table. Right? If I want to know how many tuples I'm going to feed into my join algorithm after, after I do my scan, you, you, you need to know that, and you can simply derive that based on the number of tuples. But then we need to know something about the values inside those tuples for all the different columns. So the most basic thing we can maintain is the, the number of distinct values for a given attribute in our table. So we'll define this as a function VAR, where this just says, again, the number of distinct values I have for attribute A in, in table R. And then from this, we can now derive things we actually can use to estimate the cost of executing query plans. So, right? And this is going to be the first thing we're going to derive. is called a select selection cardinality. And this is just going to be the, uh, the average number of records that have a particular value in an attribute for the, for the table. Right? So you think of something really simple, like you know, if I have 10 tuples, and I have a single attribute, and there's 10 unique values for that attribute, then the selection cardinality is, is 1. Because you know, for every given predicate, you know, if I want to say, does something equal something, I'm going to get back 1 tuple. And so this is just taking the number of tuples I have and dividing it by the number of distinct values for, for a particular attribute. So what's one obvious limitation about this? We're taking the number of tuples we have and dividing it by the number of distinct values. It assumes, yeah, sorry, go ahead, yes. So he says you, you, you need to maintain a, a set for the distinct values. Uh, thinking more high level than that. Exactly, yes. So a big assumption we're going to make here, and this is, goes back to the system R days, is that we're assuming we have uniform distribution of values to make this work, right? But we know in reality it's not the case at all. Right, just think of like just in, in, in CMU, right? CMU has 10 colleges, right? The School of Computer Science is one of them. Uh, there's way more students in SES than mm, what the other schools are, right? Music or something like that, right? So if we assume our data is uniform, then every college at CMU will have the same number of students. But that's not the case at all. Or think of like zip codes. There's way more people that live in New York City and, and those zip codes then live in, in Wyoming and Montana. So real data it does not fit this pattern at all. But to simplify our explanation of what our cost, cost estimations are doing, we're just going to make that assumption. Right? But again, we, we can go through examples of how it doesn't work out. All right, so if we assume our data is uniform, uh, then it's really easy for us to estimate the number of tuples we'd have for, uh, on unique keys when we do a quality predicates. Right? So say I have select star from people where ID equals 1, 2, 3. ID is the primary key. So the selection cardinality for this is obviously 1. Right? Because only one tuple could ever have a particular value for, that, for the ID field. So for, therefore, this predicate does something equals something has to always return 1. Things get tricky, though, is when you start having other predicates. Range queries, inequalities. And inequalities are easy. Range queries. Uh, 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 and other things like that, and, and now complex or conjunctions and disjunctions as well, right? So now, how do I estimate things like value greater than 100 or age equals 30 and status equals something, right? So now we're going to introduce to handle handle these. We can introduce a new concept called the selectivity of a predicate, and it's just think of this as like the fraction of the tuples that will qualify uh, for a given for a given predicate for like one one component of of a where clause. And so the, we'll have a bunch of formulas we can use based on the, the statistics we'll collect um, to, to estimate the selectivity. But, and they're going to be based on what kind of operation you're doing, equality, range predicates, uh, and then conjunction and disjunction. So we're going to go through a bunch of these examples. Again, we're going to assume that our data is uniform so that the math works out in most cases. But in reality, again, the, 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 this, this is not always the case. And, and commercial systems don't always make this assumption. All right, so we already showed how to do uh, predicates where it's you know, something equals something, a quality predicate on a unique key. But let's look at an example when, when uh, a key may not actually be unique. So if we assume this, we're going to have uh, the, the table people, and there'll be an attribute age. And the number of distinct values for this, this age attribute will be 5, 0 through 4. 
And then the number of tuples we have in this table is just going to be 5. So if you want to determine whether something equals something, you know, does attribute equal a constant, again, assuming that this is, this is non-unique, then our, our, the math works out to produce the selectivity. It's just we take the selection cardinality of this predicate and divide it by the number of unique values. Right? So say we're in this example here where age equals 2. We can represent our data as a histogram. Right? So for each age, the number of tuples we have uh, that are people at that age. And again, assuming in this case we only have five tuples. So each of these bars equals 1. So the first thing we would get the number of distinct values along the, the bottom of the x-axis is just 5. And then the selection a cardinality of age equals 2 is just 1. So therefore, the selectivity of this predicate is just 1 over 5, 1 fifth. Right? Simple example, and, and this works out. If we look at range queries, right, where age is greater than or equal to 2, right, you can use this formula where you, you take the max value, subtract it by the, the, the value you're trying to do a lookup on, the constant, and divide that by the, the max value minus the min value. And then that produces roughly the right, roughly the estimate, but it's not, not exactly accurate. So the way to think of it is we want to know what, what the selectivity is for this range here, where greater than or equals to 2. So we had the min and the max. And we can, we can uh, do the arithmetic for that. And then we produce uh, a one half, because right, we're taking the, the, the ceiling of this. Again, it's not entirely accurate, because in this case here, it's actually the, the, correct, the correct selectivity would be 3 fifths. The formula comes out to be one half. So this is a good example where the math is not exactly right. There's some corner cases like this where you don't get it perfect. If it was, uh, instead of greater than equals, equals, it was just greater than, then it would just be from this over, and then it would be two-fifths. Right? And again, but if we, if we use that simple formula, then it doesn't work out. For negation queries, this is actually really easy to do. right? Age isn't equal to two. Well, we already know how to compute the, the selectivity of, of age equals two. So we just take the, 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 the selection cardinality of age equals 2 and just negate it so that we get these other bounds here. And then now our selectivity is just 1 minus 1 fifth. So we get 4 fifths there. So it should be kind of clear at this point that these, uh, the selectivity looks a lot like probabilities. right? It's like, what's the probability that my predicate is going to match a particular tuple in, in, in my input? And so if we assume that there are probabilities, which is not, again, it's not always exact, not entirely accurate, but if we assume that there are actually probabilities, then we can take all the rules that we learn from you know, probability 101 in our intro math courses and apply them to our, to our predicates here. So say, again, you have, if you have a conjunction, right? You have an and clause. Right? In this case here, I've, where age equals 2 and named like some, some wild card, then I can just take the the predicate, take the the selectivity of age equals two, and multiply that by the predicate or the selectivity of the predicate name equals wild card, and then that produces my 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 total selectivity for the entire predicate, right? So think of this: P one is this range here are the tuples that will match the first predicate. P two is the range of the tuples that will match the second predicate. So the area in which the, both predicates will evaluate to true is just the intersection of this part here. And we get that by multiplying the two probabilities together. So the big assumption now, another big assumption we're making here, is that the predicates are independent of each other. And therefore, you can multiply them together. That's not always the case either. Right? Think again. Think of real, real, real data sets. I could have a, um, I could have a, a table of people their addresses, and I have zip code and city. All right? And for a particular zip code, sorry, a particular city, it's always going to be in, in one and only one zip code. So if I assume they're independent, then if I say you know, where zip code equals 15217 and city equals Pittsburgh, if I take those two predicates and multiply them together, I'm going to be sort of underestimating the number of tuples that will match me. Because it's really, if I'm, in, if I'm in zip code 15217, or sorry, if, if I'm in Z city Pittsburgh, then I have to be in 15217. So therefore, they're not independent because they're correlated with each other. So 
This math doesn't actually work out in real data sets. There's a bunch of different ways the commercial guys can handle this, but this is, again, another big fallacy or another big assumption that was made in the 1970s that still carries through to gay because this makes things easier to reason about. Disjunctions, it's, uh, it's, it's the opposite of conjunction, right? Again, we want to take all the predicates that either match this part or this part, and it's just the entire area. And then this is the math up here that, takes, takes the, that makes that assumption that they're independent and adds them together. In the back, yes. The typo where, sorry? On this? Yes, yes. Okay, I'll fix that, thank you. That's a good correction, thank you. And you didn't curse, okay. All right, so where's this all leading to? So we want to now estimate the result set size of joins. This is the thing that all the, the optimizers are gonna get wrong, and this matters the most, right? The idea is, again, given two tuples, or sorry, two tables, R and S, and some, some, some where clause of how, of how you're gonna join them, we wanna estimate the number of tuples we're gonna produce, produce as, as output, right? If we're just joining two tables, uh, this doesn't matter that much because we really care about the number of tuples getting fed into the query plan because we can decide which one's the inner versus the outer. But now if you're doing multi-way joins or, or multiple joins in your, in your query, then it matters a lot to know how, much tuple, how many tuples are getting outputted by each join because you would then you want to figure out who should be at the bottom and who, sh and who, you know, who should be the inner versus the outer that way. Because now you're joining on derived tables or join tables rather than the base tables themselves. So in the sake of time, I'm going to skip the, 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 the math here. But the basic idea is, again, it's just we're estimating the number of tuples getting fed in from, the, from, the, from one table and the other table. And then we have some simple formula to estimate the number of tuples that will match on this. But as I said, in, in, the, in most systems, they get this horribly wrong. Actually, in all systems, they get this horribly wrong. Because the problem is that if you get the, if you get the selectivity slightly incorrect for the joins at the bottom of the query plan, then as you go up, they, that, that, the, that error increases, right? Because now you're throwing errors on errors on errors, and it gets worse and worse and worse. So again, we'll cover this in the advanced class. We don't have time to do it here, but um, SQL Server actually does the best job of, of, of figuring this thing out, and most systems underestimate it. And you would get underestimation if you make the assumptions like uniform data distribution or, or uh, ind uh, independent probabilities. All right, so this is fine. So now we have some basic formulas we can use to estimate the selectivity of, of predicates, right? And we can use that to figure out how many tuples are getting fed into an operator and how many tuples are gonna, it's going to output. But how are we actually deriving those, that selectivity? Like, what is the underlying information we have? We have? So the, the way the data system is going to maintain information about what your data actually looks like is through histograms. Right, the the basic idea is that for every you know every unique value or or, or a range of values, how many tuples actually uh, have have that particular value, right? So in the case here, along the x-axis we have the number of distinct values for an attribute, and then the y-axis is the number of occurrences. Again, for this particular example, I'm assuming our data is uniform, so there's actually nothing I really really need to store here. I just can store one value and say all tuples have you know all values. For every value in my table for this particular attribute, there will be five tuples that match it. The problem is real data looks something like this, right? It's the, the, the distribution is all over the map. It's oftentimes, it's a Ziffian distribution, right? So like a, like a power law curve. But for our purposes here, this is fine. And so now the problem is for a particular attribute, a particular value in that attribute, we would have to maintain a giant map that says, for this value, here's the count for it. Right? And this, if you think about how you actually would implement this, if you just, if for every single distinct value you maintain this mapping, it would be huge. Right? For a column where you have, say, unique numbers, if you have a 32-bit number uh, and that's unique throughout the entire column, in your histogram map, you would have another 32-bit integer just to keep track of the, the number of tuples that have that value, and it's always going to be one. Right, always, or some smaller. So you're essentially doubling the size of every single column because you have to store this additional information. So the way to, to fix this is to use buckets. 
right? So the idea here is that for every for every three values in our in our uh, in our histogram, we're just going to bucket them together, count the number of tuples that they have, or the number of values that, that or number of occurrences that they have, and then for every single bucket, we just have keep track of the, the min and max, and then the count for that. Right, so we're condensing down the, 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 the information so that it's a more manageable size. Of course, what's the obvious problem with this? Right? Say it again, sorry. He says the problem is you have to maintain these numbers. So we're not so much, yes, you have to maintain the numbers. We talked about that before. The, you run analyze or you, that you have this background process that actually does this. I'm thinking more in terms of the accuracy of this information. Right, he says they're going to be largely different numbers, right? So we're, we're, we're sort of blindly bucketing together uh, contiguous values in, in, our, in our range list. And that may actually not be the right thing to do because there may be, because uh, since we're taking essentially just computing the average now, you, it could be something with a really low value and a really high value, and we're missing those outliers. So the way to fix this is to use what are called equidwith histograms. And for this one, I'll use quantiles. Um, and the idea is that for every... As we go along, for every single bucket, the count's always going to be the same. It's just we're going to have a variable number of, of elements or, or, or values in that bucket. So in, the in, the, in the, these three buckets here, bucket one, bucket two, bucket four, the count will be 12. So we try to add as many values as we can to get that, you know, to get that count to be 12. This, this middle guy here is sort of an outlier. He has a larger bucket size or bucket width, and the count's only nine. Right, so then we end up something like this. So the number elements, or the count per bucket, will be the same, roughly, but the number of, of values, distinct values in a bucket, can, can vary. And another option also to do is to, to maintain a separate data structure for heavy hitters. Like if I know I have one value that has way, a way different number of, uh, of occurrences in our column than all other values, I'll maintain that as a separate data structure because I want to have really accurate predictions for that one. So sort of a combination of, the, of these things to, to, to make this all work. So again, these histograms are essentially, you're compressing the data about, the metadata about, about your data, and we have to do this to make it more manageable. But again, we, we sacrifice accuracy. What's well, another approach we could use instead of maintaining histograms? To estimate you know, the number of tuples for a particular value. I try this every year, and no one actually can guess it. Sampling, right? So the, the idea is that rather than checking a histogram to say, you know, how many, what's my selectivity for a predicate for on this particular value, I'll just collect some sample data from the underlying table, and then just run a complete sequential scan on that sample, and that helps me, and I can use that to figure out my, the selectivity of my predicates. Right, so let's say I have a query here. I want to select uh, all the people with age greater than 50. Let's say I have a billion tuples. Right, so what I'll do is for that query, I'll just sample every other or something like that. It's usually a much smaller, smaller amount. Store this in a sort of a temporary table that's only accessible to the query optimizer. So you're, you're treating this like a regular table, but it's just you can't run queries against it. Right, so you're using all the same, you know, table storage and, and heap storage stuff we talked about before. And then when my query shows up and I say, all right, what's the selectivity of age greater than 50? I just do a sequential scan on my, on my sample to figure out what it is. All right, I don't look at any histograms. And the idea is that if I have, obviously, a, a reasonably large enough sample size, then that would be an accurate re reflection of what the underlying table looks like. Yes? One slide. Yes? So the question is, why is this called equity width, whereas the buckets are not called equity width? Um, good question. So this would be equity width, right? Because you always take th three elements. Let me double check that. What's that? Equity what, what? Yes. Equity death. All right. Is that what it's called? I don't know. Okay. We'll double, 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 <laughs> we'll double check this. Okay. All right. So uh, we have like eight minutes left. Um, 
I'm gonna I'm gonna pause this now. We'll come back to this after the midterm because um, I want to get through the review. But just to understand where we're at, we we've been able to uh, we have we have a way to derive information about the tables we want to run queries on. We have some formulas we can use to to estimate the selectivity of predicates. And then in the next phase, we want to figure out uh, how we actually can use that information to help us guide our search to find a better query plan. So let's pause on this for now, because um, we only have 10 minutes left. And we'll go to the, uh, the midterm review. OK. So again, the midterm is this Wednesday in this class at the same time, right? Uh, Everyone needs to take the midterm. No, no one's excluded, right? Uh, you should bring your CMU ID because I need to. You know, it's a class of 100 people, so I need to be able to check who's who. Uh, you need to bring uh, a, a calculator to help you do the, you know the basic formulas that, that we've, we've talked about, um, and then you're allowed to bring a one-page double-sided of handwritten notes with anything anything you want, any formula, things like that. So that means you can't take the slides and sort of compress them down and try to fit them onto a page. Everything has to be handwritten. And I do that because I, th I think you get more out of it that way instead of just copying and pasting, all right? So this is my list of what not to bring, and it gets longer every single year. So a few years ago, someone brought a live animal. Don't do that, right? And then last year, somebody brought their wet laundry from their dorm, right? And I was like, what the hell's going on, right? So they brought it, and it wasn't this room, but it was another room. They brought it to dry while they were taking the exam, and it smelled kind of funky because it was like sitting in the washing machine overnight. So you do not bring your wet laundry, all right? If you have something crazy you want to bring, email me beforehand and let me know and figure out whether it's okay. Because otherwise, I gotta you know add you to the list here, right? So, no snakes, no dogs, no wet laundry. Okay. So the midterm will cover everything up into up to and including the the joint lecture, lecture twelve. Uh, you're gonna be closed book. You get you get one uh, one sheet of handwritten notes, double sided. And then if you need any special accommodations, uh, please email me now so I, we, we can make sure those things happen. And then this is the link to what I post on Piazza for the midterm study guide. that has the list of chapters that, that are covered in, in the textbook um, that are relevant to, to the exam, and then a link to go find the solutions to any, I think, the odd problems if you want to expand uh, the things that you're looking at. And a link also to the, uh, the practice exam that we gave out from a few years ago. OK? All right, so what's going to be on, on the exam? So obviously the relational model, uh, the, you know, the focus on integrity constraints, what does that mean, um, and relational algebra. We didn't cover any relational calculus, so don't worry about that if it's in the textbook. Right? Again, I'm not going to ask you to write more complex things. Just understand what these basic operators actually do. Uh, for SQL, again, everyone should already know SQL from the first homework assignment. Uh, and so I'll ask sort of high-level questions about the more complex things that we covered, right? Joins, aggregations, the common table expressions. Right? These are the things that you guys did in the first homework assignment. I won't cover window functions because you guys weren't actually able to do that in SQLite. Um, and again, think about it. We're, we're not going to ask you to write really complex queries because you have to write it, you know, on paper. We, that's, we're not going to be able to run it and test it and see whether it actually works. So we're more, we're more interested in the high-level concepts about what these queries are actually doing. And then this comes up every year. And then for common table expressions, it would include rec recursive expressions. So then we can get into the actual implementation of the database system. So we covered things like buffer, buffer management policies. So you know, LRU, MRU, clock, um, how to handle sequential flooding. We talked about how to actually represent the database on disk, or heap files, or linked lists, page directories, things like that. Then we talked about when you bring or what's actually inside the page. Right? We talked about slotted page layout. We talked about log structure layout. We talked about what the tuple, how to actually represent data in tuples. Right? What's in the header, things like that. Then we talked about hash, hash tables. So again, there's two high-level approaches to hashing. There's the static hash tables, like linear probing, the Robin Hood, cuckoo hashing. And then there was the dynamic hash tables, extendable hashing, chained hashing, and linear hashing. And again, we're not going to ask you to you know, write code. It's more about the high-level concepts of what these different uh, hashing schemes actually do. I don't care about hash functions. It's more about the hash table itself. And then we also want to care about uh, how these data structures relate to or compare with B plus trees. Right? When would you want to use a hash table versus a B plus tree? 
Then we talked about order preserving tree indexes. And we spent a lot of time talking about B plus trees. You guys are building this for your, for your first second assignment. So insertions, deletions, splits, merges, how they differ with a B tree or a B link tree at a high level, and how to actually do latch crabbing, latch coupling, including doing leaf node scans. And any basic optimizations like you know, delayed, or, delayed parent uh, splitting. And then we talked about a little bit about radix trees and skip lists. I realize this is not in the textbook, so we're not going to issue complicated things. It's more about a high level. What are the, the, what are the high level uh, design differences between these different data structures versus, versus B plus trees? Then we talked about sorting. In particular, we, we focused on the external merge sort. We talked about two variants of it, right? There was the, sort of the, the two-way merge sort, and then there was the, 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 the K-way, or the general purpose external merge sort. And the basic questions are going to be things like, as you're seeing in, in, the, in the current homework assignment, right? if I have a data file that looks like this, and I have this in many buffers, how many passes do I need to do, or how, how quickly can I sort it? Right? Query processing, we talked about different processing models. Iterator or Volcano versus vectorized versus materialized. Again, what are the design trade-offs and performance characteristics of these different approaches? What kind of workloads would you want to use one versus another, right? And then we talked about join algorithms, nested loop joins, hash joins, and sort merge joins. Again, what are the performance implications of them? If I give you a data set with this, how many, this many tuples, this many pages, you have this many blocks, how many, you know, how, how many disk IOs are, is, it, is it going to take you to do the join, right? So this is it. So any, any questions? Everyone feels very, fairly confident. It's databases, right? It should be fun. It should be awesome. Okay. If that's it, then we're, then we're done. Uh, so next class after the exam, we'll cover parallel query execution. We'll, we'll finish off on the query optimization stuff. Then we'll talk about doing parallel query execution. Again, the idea here is that everything we've, we've, we've focused on so far has been sort of running single thread to do your joins or whatever you want to do. Now you want to say in a, in a modern database system, that has multiple cores, how does the execution change if you, have, if you can run parallel threads? And be, just to say, this is not the same thing as distributed execution. That'll be covered later on. This is like a single box. How can I run things in parallel? OK? All right, I'll have office hours now. Uh, email me if you have any questions. And any of those questions about the, bit, the, the practice exam on Piazza, we'll take care of that later today. All right, guys? See ya. <laughs> That's my favorite all pattern. Uh, <laughs> no. What is it? Yes. It's the S-T Cricket I-D-E-S I make a mess unless I can do it like a Geo Ice Cube with the G to the E to the T -O. Now here it comes, Duke I play the game where there's no rules Homies on the cuff say I'm a fool cause I drink fruit Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes, show. Here I come, Willie D, that's me Rolling with Fifth Watt, South Park and South Central, G And St. Eyes when I party by the 12 pack case of a boy. Six pack 48 gets the real price. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say fruit makes you fat. But saying eyes is straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>